festivities on the Waikato River, and the Governor General, Sir Bernard Freiburg, and Lady Freiburg are welcomed by the people of the Ngarawahia Pa. The war canoes are decorated with full regalia, and the Governor General's party are to be given the place of honor. Ngarawahia is a regatta center, and the Governor General's visit climaxed several weekends of sport and carnival. On March the 15th, the Ngarawahia Regatta Association held its 50th Jubilee Carnival, and 17,000 people crowded the riverbanks. Girls from the Frankton Maori Hostel and the Wahi Pa Huntley entertained from a river barge. During the day, there were canoe races for men and women. The aim of the Regatta Association is to encourage the sports of the Maori people, and there are big prizes for making the paddles fly. Watermelon is sixpence a slice, and what you lose on the swings, you make up on the roundabouts. The carnival is on. It's hot and noisy, but what unique fascinations are yours inside? Australian reptiles and the daredevil de Bakers with Mamselle Fifi coming up on the outside. Ladies and gentlemen, step right inside and see the cosmopolitan circus. Never has so much been done by one so little. And when you ring the bell, one white owl cigar. Another free go for the gentleman. If you don't speculate, you can't accumulate. That's all the luck of the game, and there's a good time for one and all. Like a bite? Don't mind if I do. To cap off the show, the under and over hurdles. Two men to a canoe, and the best team wins. One more to go, and they crash them over. It's no mean art. The front man's lost his paddle, but they carry on to win. Holidays and melon. On the Waikato, all the good things seem to come at once. About a day's journey from the New Zealand-occupied zone in Japan is a unique farm, a pearl farm. Japanese girls do most of the diving on the farm, and here they're getting warmed up before taking the plunge. It seems the wrong way round, but the girls think it's better to get warm before the swim instead of afterwards. Well, they ought to know. Actually, the girls dive not for the oysters that contain the pearls, but for the ones that don't, the young oysters that grow wild on the seabed. They'll be brought to the surface and treated in such a way that after a few further years at the bottom of the sea, they'll produce the pearl. Operation Pearl is performed. A small piece of mother-of-pearl shell is placed inside the oyster's innards. It's special shell that comes all the way from the Mississippi River in America. Then the oyster is deposited in the ocean bed for five years. This man is dragging up baskets of oysters that are now ready for opening. There's only a 10% chance that they won't all contain pearls. Less of a gamble about pearl farming in Japan than fruit farming in New Zealand, it seems to us. The workers on this pearl production line get a minute wage, and although there are thousands of pounds worth of pearls here, there's hardly any theft. Cultured pearls. Soon they'll be adorning the necks of beautiful women all over the world, or at least the rich ones. The pearls are dispatched to Paris, London, and New York. We're wondering if our cameraman brought any back to Wellington, but he won't tell. The owner of this remarkable farm is Mr. Mickey Moto, and of course he's a millionaire. So maybe some of the boys in J-Force will be wanting to start a pearl farm when they get back home. There was a time when North Auckland was covered with bush, 
It was thick, luxuriant bush. Totara and Rimu and Kauri and Panga grew out of the earth. Then came the Pakeha to settle the land. He cut down the great trees, and with his bullock teams, he dragged the logs out. If he couldn't cut them down, he burnt them down. The bush was decimated. It began to disappear. Today, great areas of dead forest cover the North Auckland Peninsula. But there's another side to the story. Here is one of the men who form part of a great plan of preservation for what still remains and reconstruction for the future. Nick Yarkos is his name and he's a Dalmatian by birth. Nick has been climbing cowrie trees for over 20 years and now he's going up to the top of this giant to recover cones from the upper branches. For the cones contain seeds that can be planted. This officer of the State Forest Service will take these cone seeds to the Forest Service Nursery at Waipua. The seeds germinate and are planted out. After two years of careful nursing, the young cowries are planted again between tea tree windbreaks. At Waipua, hundreds of cowrie seeds are under constant cultivation. They'll form part of a future forest. This tiny plant will grow as big as this one day, but it will take well over 2,000 years. One of the things the State Forest Service is also doing is to supervise the removal of dead trees. When a tree has died, it becomes a serious fire menace and might well lead to the total destruction of the forest. Here, an officer of the department is marking a tree that will have to be cut down. Its timber is still usable, and the tree will soon be turned into sink tops, boats, and dairy churns. The tree is cut to fall in a place where it will do the least damage to surrounding growth. And it doesn't take long for tractors to haul out this giant log for dispatch to the timber mill. Much of the Waipua forest is still intact and the State Forest Service is embarking on the huge task of regeneration so that in the years to come, Waipua will be one of the proudest possessions of our time.